Hi everyone, welcome to episode 11 of a comprehensive review of dermatopathology. But today we're going to cover tumors of fat, muscle, bone, and fibrous tissue. So we've got a lot to go over today. One of the main things that we uh, deal with when we're dealing with neoplasms is identifying which cell type you're dealing with. So today we're going to kind of go over a few of these spindled cells that come up to see how we can distinguish them. So first we'll start with fat, which tends to be easier for people. And the most basic is a lipoma where you'll see sheets of mature adipose tissue. And so it almost looks like a blank slide when you put it up, but you had, should have very thin septae between these mature adipose um, cells. And then what you see is they should all be relatively even in size. So these are actual cells. You see a little nucleus and it's just a mature adipocyte. An angiolipoma is when greater than 5% of the mass is compo composed of blood vessels. And often you'll see fibrin in the vessel walls. It can be painful. This is the only fatty tumor with a normal karyotype. It's thought to be hamartomatous or reactive, but not truly a tumor. About 50% of plain lipomas have um, normal karyotypes. So this is an angiolipoma. You can see it's much more cellular and between the areas of normal adipocytes, you will see these increased blood vessels. So the cellularity makes you go in and look and rather than being random spindled cells, you see actual cells making these little blood vessels and some are filled with blood and some are filled with this more gummy pink material, which we know at this point to be fibrin. And these can be little painful tumors and this is part of the reason why. A spindle cell lipoma, on the other hand, has a proliferation of spindled cells um, with some fibrous tissue mixed among the mature adipocytes. It can also be myxoid. And these spindled cells, we're not really sure what they are. They're some progenitor cell, um, and they might be fibroblastic. They might be um, precursors to adipocytes. The problem is something like CD34 would stain both. So here is a spindle cell lipoma, and what you can tell is even though it's very cellular and not really fatty, you can see that there are adipocytes kind of scattered throughout, giving you a hint that this is a fatty tumor. And when you look up close, now you see the cellularity is not forming a little blood vessels. They're just these spindled cells, and this particular one is myxoid. That's that bluish background that you see between these normal-looking adipocytes. Here's another look at it, spindled cells, making a spindle cell lipoma. And this is just a side-by-side -side of the spindle cell lipoma with an angiolipoma where the cells are actually, you know, um, endothelial cells making blood vessels. A pleomorphic lipoma um, implies that you have these cells that are now pleomorphic, so they're kind of different looking than each other and somewhat bizarre looking. Again, you'll have mature adipocytes and collagen and some myxoid in cellular areas, um, but you'll have these somewhat florette shaped or spindled or lipoblast like cells in between your adipocytes. You should not have mitotic figures because this is a benign process. So just looking from far away, you can see that there's a lot more fibrous tissue set between the mature adipocytes in this little fatty tumor. And when you go in, you see these dark cells, more so than you would see in normal septae between um, the adipocytes. And these dark cells have large kind of florette or triangular or multinucleated looking kind of stranger um, nuclei. And they are outside of the adipocytes, more in the stromal area. These pleomorphic lipomas actually share a karyotype with the spindle cell lipoma. So they're on a spectrum with each other. Um, it's just that the nuclei look somewhat different. So here's another look, emphasizing how these funny looking nuclei are actually in the stromal collagen rather than as the nuclei of the adipocytes. So, as I just mentioned, the spindle cell lipoma and the pleomorphic lipoma share cytogenetic changes. It's a loss of 16Q, in case you were curious. Um, these cells are CD34 positive, which we can see in fibroblasts and adipocytes. And they're S100 negative, factor 13A positive. All right, 
well, what's a fibrolipoma? So a fibrolipoma is a lipoma with more prominent fibrotic septate, but this should look like normal collagen. So normal collagen that's more abundant within the lipoma is a fibrolipoma. So here, so you don't have that proliferation of spindled cells and you don't have the proliferation of pleomorphic cells. It's just more collagen in between. And these are the types of lipomas that you see like on the forehead and they don't kind of squeeze out as easily as other lipomas. You might have to carve them out a little bit because they hang tighter onto the dermis around them. Okay. Nevis lipomatosis is a, is a fat tumor where the fat replaces much of the dermis. So it's like very superficial fat and it may not even connect to the underlying subcutaneous tissue. To really know it's a nevus lipomatosis, you kind of have to have a clinical history where it occurs in the first two decades of life and is in the pelvic girdle area. But you know, in middle aged people, we tend to see a lot of these fatty tumors around the pelvic girdle. And at that point, the differential is a nevus lipomatosis versus a superficial lipoma versus a fatty tag. And we can't really distinguish them without a clinical history. So here you can see a section of skin and this proliferation of mature, normal looking adipocytes is up here in the dermis. And then here is your subcutaneous tissue, okay? So with all those clinical features, this would be a nevus lipomatosis. A hibernoma is that fatty collection in a little baby um, that you can see, and it's known to have these mulberry cells. So for anyone who doesn't know what a mulberry look like, looks like, this is what a mulberry looks like. So here's another fatty tumor, and you can see now that it doesn't look exactly as clean as a lipoma, because if you look up close, these adipocytes, not only do they vary a little bit in size and shape, but you have all these little vacuoles inside of it. And these are what's been referred to as the mulberry cells in a hibernoma. Nothing else looks like this. Okay, so then we move on to, those are the benign things for fatty tumors, and we move on to the more atypical and malignant things. So a typical lipomatous tumor is where you'll have adipocytes of varying sizes, and now you'll have nuclear atypia. You might have a hard time distinguishing this from a pleomorphic lipoma, but remember those were nuclei in the stromal component, whereas this is a typical nuclei of the actual adipocyte. Um, there are stages of atypia before you move on to full liposarcoma, so these tend to have a good prognosis, but the general recommendation is to remove them if you see them. So from far away, it kind of looks like a lipoma, but what should strike you is now the fat cells are different in size than that original lipoma where they were all sort of the same size. And as you go in and you look closely, you're gonna start to see that your nuclei are not you know, barely visible the way they should be in a normal adipocyte. They're kind of larger and darker. When you go in even closer, you can see that these nuclei of these adipocytes are kind of funny looking. So this is something we put into this category called atypical lipomatous tumor. In contrast, when you get to liposarcoma, then you get significant atypia. Often you have to look really hard to even know that you're dealing with a fatty tumor. You might have very few areas with recognizable adipocytes. You can have very well differentiated ones where it's easier to tell a lot more fat cells or you may have sclerosing spindle cell or pleomorphic. Okay, and so in this one, if you look from far away, you can see a few of the adipocytes. That's your only clue that this is a fatty tumor, because otherwise when you go in close, you might have a bunch of cells like this, and you can see now obviously there's a significant amount of pleomorphism among the nuclei of the adipocytes. So this is sort of the other end of the spectrum, where you call it liposarcoma, and the atypical lipomatous tumor is kind of a middle step in between them. Okay. So look around, you see the little adipocytes, then you're guessing that you're dealing with a fatty tumor. So otherwise, if you look at this nucleus, there's no way you could possibly tell what type of cell this is. Okay, and here again, mitotic figure, atypical nuclei, but you know, they are forming recognizable adipocytes. So as a reminder, side by side, pleomorphic lipoma, funny looking cells in the collagen, atypical lipomatous tumor, atypical nuclei among the adipocytes, and then 
sarcoma, liposarcoma, big bad nuclei. Okay, so now let's move on to muscle. So mostly what we deal with in the skin is smooth muscle as opposed to skeletal muscle. So we'll focus on smooth muscle tumors. An angiolyomyoma is smooth muscle that derives from the blood vessels. So where in the skin do we see smooth muscle? We see it around the blood vessels and we see it in the pilorectal muscles and then in the breast and the, the scrotum area, we see other specialized smooth muscles. So dartos, those kinds of muscles. So an angiolyoma is a tumor of the smooth muscle that surrounds the blood vessels and it occurs as a pink nugget. You just get a really well circumscribed pink nugget kind of deeper down in the dermis or circuitus. And you might see it spinning off of the blood vessels. And the key is identifying when you're looking at these spindled cells, what makes something smooth muscle. So they tend to be blunt ended cigar shaped nuclei. That means it's almost like a cylinder shape as opposed to being a a spindle with tapered ends. And then you'll see a perinuclear clearing, these little white dots we call glycogen snacks near the nucleus. That is really the feature that helps me most identify that I'm dealing with smooth muscle. So on low power, here's your pink nugget, right? So you're kind of in this pink nugget differential and then you go in and these little crack spaces here, these are your blood vessels and spinning off your blood vessels is this solid pink um, tumor where if you look closely, you can identify smooth muscle. So all these little white dots, these are the little glycogen snacks of smooth muscle. Now, you remember we are looking at things in 2D. In 3D, smooth muscle tends to run in fascicles often. And so sometimes when you cut it, the nucleus is coming at you. And sometimes when you cut it, the nucleus is going side to side. So when you look at a nucleus side to side, that's when you see the cigar shaped nucleus. If you cut the nucleus coming at you, then you're just gonna see a circle, okay? So this is a smooth muscle nucleus cross-sectionally, and these are the little white glycogen snacks that tell you you're dealing with smooth muscle. Here's a little red blood cell in your squished vessel, right? All this muscle is squishing the vessel flat, um, but that kind of helps tell you that you're dealing with a blood vessel. Angiolyomyoma is basically, sorry, an angiomyolipoma is basically an angiolyomyoma with fat, and it's likely a hamartomatous tumor. It's not to be confused with the term we use for renal angiomyolipomas in tuberous sclerosis. Those are totally different tumors. So there's two names for, there's one name for two different tumors. So an angiomyolipoma, just remember for our purposes, is generally just an angiomyoma, and it has a little bit of fat in it. So again, here's your pink nugget. If we look, we're gonna see that these little areas are centered around blood vessels, and it's a smooth muscle tumor, and then we see we have a little bit of fat in it. So here's the tumor spinning off these little cracks, which are your blood vessels, and then here's your fat in between. And then if you look closely, you can see, sometimes you'll see your nucleus side to side, and that's gonna be your cigar shaped nucleus. And sometimes you're gonna cut it cross-sectionally, and that's gonna be a circle, right? But then you'll have all your little white vacuoles, your glycogen snacks, indicating that you have smooth muscle. Pyloliomyomas are lyomyomas that come off of the pylorectal muscles. Um, that insert into your hair follicles. So these are gonna be more fascicles that are kind of elongated strands rather than circular aggregates that you would see around a round blood vessel. These are non-encapsulated and they're usually multiple. So here it's occurring in the dermis, which makes sense because that's where your pylorectal muscles are. And see this side to side group might be a pylorectal muscle and the rest of it might be spinning off of it. And you can see it happens in fascicles. So you have some areas that run side to side and some areas that are groups that are coming at you when they're cut cross-sectionally. See so side to side, see so your nucleus is vaguely cigar shaped, meaning your ends are blunted like a little cylinder, if you will. And then here's when they're coming at you, they're gonna be cut and look more round. But in all cases, you can see multiple little white circles, the vacuolated spaces, which are your glycogen snacks, telling you that you are dealing with smooth muscle, okay? Again, lots of white spaces, 
nuclei that are blunt ended, little white snacks everywhere. So what's a leiomyosarcoma? Well, if you take the leiomyoma and you make the cells pleomorphic or even more cellular than usual, then you are often deal then you're dealing with a leiomyosarcoma. Okay, and they might have scattered mitotic figures, but they're often very well differentiated. So you usually can still tell that you're dealing with smooth muscle. You just have a lot of atypia of the nuclei. So here's a low power view. This is an artifact. This is folding of the tissue as it was placed on the slide. And then if you look up close, again, you have these sort of blunt ended nuclei. But if you were to compare one to the other, the cells, it would be more cellular, meaning you see more nuclei. And then when you go up really close, you see you have all your glycogen snacks. So it tells you, oh, I'm dealing with smooth muscle. But look at your mitotic figures and look at how some of your nuclei are really pale and some of them are really dark. They're different shapes and sizes. That's pleomorphism. So this is a leiomyosarcoma. Here's another picture of an, a section that's not cut so cross-sectionally, and you can see your long, blunt-ended nuclei, your glycogen snacks, and your pleomorphism. Here's a side-by-side. -side. As a reminder, here's your leiomyoma. Here's the concentration of nuclei that you see in normal smooth muscle, and then you can appreciate this is much more cellular, and you've got your atypia and your mitotic figures. And then just as a review, a lot of people remember that a Becker's nevus, right, um, has a hamartomatous proliferation of smooth muscle. So what's the difference between a smooth muscle hamartoma and say a leiomyoma? Well, you can see here, here's the main component of the Becker's is just epidermal hyperplasia and a little bit of hyperpigmentation. You know, it's on your differential of an early seborrhea keratosis, a regular epidermal nevus, acanthosis nigricans, confluent reticulated papillomatosis, that's a nonspecific change. But if you get a nice punch biopsy and you see an increased number of normal smooth muscle bundles, but not quite so densely packed that it's tumor-like concentration, then that's your smooth muscle hamartoma that's associated often with a Becker's nevus. All right, there's not much in bone and they're not really tumors that we're talking about here. So when you're looking at bone, bone is tissue, so you're going to have nuclei in bone, um, no cartilage, and it can be surrounded by osteoclasts. These are those multinucleated giant cells that are kind of always eating up the bone. It's always building and breaking down kind of together at the same time. So you have this pink stuff in the dermis. You might think, well, is that, is that calcium? What is that deposit that's in the skin? You can see a naked hair shaft and significant inflammation. Your body's like, well, it doesn't really belong here. Let me try to eat it up. And then when you go in here, you have these multinucleated osteoclast type cells. And when you look in here, you see nuclei, right? Because bone is tissue. So you have nuclei as opposed to, say, a calcium deposit. You're not going to have nuclei because it's an inert substance. And here is a different type of bone where it's more trabeculated, but again, you can see it's almost like a pyogenic granuloma-like um, change here. Kind of a lot of granulation tissue. It's sort of perforating out of the skin. You have these kind of parigo-like changes on the sides. And when you go in, what's this pink stuff? See, you've got your little nuclei in your bone and then some granulation tissue and some multinucleated cells surrounding it, okay? That's it for bone. We just threw it in there because it helps us be complete. Okay, so fibrous tumors. This is the main, the bigger section of this chapter, and this is the section that most people do not like. So we'll cover it in great detail. So fibrous tumors produce collagen, and this is the next one in our major spindle cell differential. Okay, and so how do we know a spindled nucleus is smooth muscle versus fibrous versus neural? Well, one of the things about fibrous things is that they make collagen, so they tend to be more firm than something neural, and they lack the little white glycogen snacks of smooth muscle. So we have some purely fibrous things like an angiofibroma, acrofibrokeratoma, and then these various other fibromas. And then we'll move on to other things that include fibrohistiocytic tumors. These are tumors made of a cell type probably earlier in the differentiation stage, 
where they can be, they have some elements that are fibroblastic and some elements that look histiocytic and they might stain for them. So we're not exactly sure what cell this is, but it's probably a more pluripotent cell earlier in the differentiation um, state of things. And this is a list of other things that we will go over, okay? So we'll just start with a few fibromas. Basically, if you look at something that's shaped like a papule and what makes it bump upward is mostly fibrous tissue, then you are looking at a fibroma. And among the fibromas, we've typed different fibromas, but the key element to identify is just that you are looking at a fibroma. Okay, when you make the collagen firm, you take it from being the nice loopy collagen that we see in normal dermis, and if you stretch it tight, then often you'll see this onion skinning phenomenon where you see these white spaces between the collagen bundles. And then anything that's fibromatous, you should have a slightly increased number of fibroblasts, or they might become more prominent, like larger spindled, cellate, multinucleated, etc. So an angiofibroma is a type of fibroma. And if you look at this bump, ignore this artifactual hole here, but you see this follicle and these sebaceous lobules are not making the bump. It's just collagen making this bump. And when we go in closely, you see this collagen has an increased number of fibroblasts. If you look back at normal collagen, this is increased the collagen is more close together and you start to see a little bit of prominence and onion skinning around your vessels, okay? You might even see more defined white spaces between the collagen because normally they kind of loop around kind of haphazardly in normal dermis. So if you have a fibroma with a prominent vascular component, then you have an angiofibroma and it's nothing more exciting than that. And a subcategory of angiofibroma, the fibrous papule, is a type that we see on the nose. Okay, so thick collagen bundles, when they're firm, sometimes you see these straight white spaces between them and you might see a little bit of onion skinning, but there's not actually much prominent onion skinning in this particular angiofibroma. An acral fibrokeratoma, aka acquired digital fibroma, or the same uh, as periungal fibromas of tuberous sclerosis is a fibroma with kind of a similar somewhat angiomatous component, but that has hyperkeratosis above it. So it just means you have a fibroma that has epidermal hyperplasia and hyperkeratosis above it, okay? So here again, this component, what makes this bump? The bump is not from the hyperkeratosis, though it gives it a certain look. The bump is made from this production of collagen in the middle. So here's our collagen, it's a little thicker. And again, we look up close and we have more prominent fibroblasts. We may or may not have increased blood vessels. That really doesn't make the huge difference. The huge difference is that you have a fibroma and that it's hyperkeratotic. And here's another one. This would be more the periungal fibroma of tuberous sclerosis. You have this more vascular component, so it's more like an angiofibroma. And again, you have this hyperkeratosis above it. And they're usually, you know, they're usually near the digits. That's why it has a name, acquired digital fibroma. But, you know, sometimes we see these on the elbows, etc. And so, the name went from that to acral fibrokeratoma to just plain fibrokeratoma. So there's different names for these. But the big picture is that they are fibromas, okay? So what's a pleomorphic fibroma? Well, we talked about pleomorphic lipomas, which were just lipomas with these funny pleomorphic cells. Well, a pleomorphic fibroma is the same. It's just a fibroma, but now these nuclei of these fibroblasts are kind of funny looking. So going up close, oh, sorry, Back here, we see it, it was too large to fit in one screen, but you have another dome-shaped papule where the middle is composed of all collagen. So you have a fibroma, and now look at your nuclei. Your fibroblast nuclei are like sometimes multinucleated, triangular, they're kind of bizarre shaped. They're pleomorphic, meaning they all look like, they, they do not look like each other. So that is what a pleomorphic fibroma is, okay? Next up is a sclerotic fibroma. 
Now, once things are fibrotic for a long, long time, sometimes you lose the nuclei and they become sclerotic, which is kind of pink and hyalinized without many nuclei, posse cellular. And so like I talked about earlier, when you get things really firm with lots of collagen, you might see a lot of these white cracking spaces. And sometimes they can create this sort of wood grain pattern that we see with sclerotic fibromas. Okay. So now on to more reactive things. So nodular fasciitis. So we're moving away from fibromas now and we're talking more about fibrominous processes because this is actually more of a reactive thing than a true tumor. But basically, like we talked about in the fibrosing chapter, when you have immature collagen, it's more blue because there's a lot of mucin. It's the extracellular matrix stuff. It's you know all the edema that comes and helps bring everything that's the building blocks of a scar. It has a granulation tissue-like quality and then with age, it becomes more red. It's usually based in the subcutis and it happens generally in younger patients because the scarring process is more aggressive in that age group. And it can be highly cellular and the main differential that you're gonna have to worry about might be something like a sarcoma. So here's where we have this very cellular spindled tumor and you're gonna be like, well, where do I get started with that? How do I know what that is? And when you go in, your main differential is gonna be, well, are these spindled cells neural? Are they muscle or are they fibroblastic? And I think that it's pretty easy to tell that these are not smooth muscle. But neural can be difficult because how, you know, when it's kind of wavy like this, it's hard to tell if something is um, neural or fibroblastic. You could do a stain. If it's S100 negative, then it's probably not neural. But you see here, you have a lot of these fibroblasts and they're wavy and they're sitting among collagen. But if you have large areas like here where you're starting to get fibrosis, that's your clue that you're dealing with a fibroblastic process because granulation tissue, as it ages, you start to lay collagen, right? It becomes more red. So this, these will often have a mixed picture. And here's another thing where it's a younger lesion, right? More edema. But as you go in, you're also gonna see a lot of blood vessels, you're gonna see inflammatory cells, and it should really remind you of granulation tissue. Again, here's a more fibrotic area that's gonna kind of be your hint that you're not dealing with something neural. You have these spindled cells, and if you had a basic science background, it might remind you of a cell culture, but for those of us that don't have a basic science background, that might, you know, not mean anything to you. So these are what fibroblasts look like early and it's apparently what a cell culture looks like. Okay, so kind of nondescript nuclei, you see they're a little bit tapered ended, but slightly fascicular and neural things tend not to look so much like that. So one of these is granulation tissue and one of these is nodular fasciitis. And can you really tell a difference? No, they're essentially the same thing. All right. Another fibronous process is called dermatomyofibroma. It's strangely named, but what it is, it's this east-west oriented fascicular fibrotic process. So it basically usually runs to the middle of a dermis, and that's really the way you're going to make the diagnosis, okay? The upper dermis is unaffected, and you'll hopefully see dermis below it that's unaffected. And it can be fascicular, right? So fibrotic and muscular thing to be fascicular, meaning that they twist and turn and you'll see in 3D some sections coming at you and some sections going side by side. But when you look in, you see you only have these spindled cells and you see how the ends are tapered and they're waving along with the collagen. See, and here's the fascicle coming at you where you've cut it cross-sectionally and you see the cross-section of the nucleus and here's sections side by side. So something like this that runs east-west through the tissue plane is a dermatomyofibroma. Here's your little cross-sectional pieces. Okay, what's a solitary fibrous tumor? You're, you really shouldn't have to know this for the test, but is a very broad generalization. It's this well-circumscribed little proliferation that's not encapsulated, and it's known for having this patternless pattern, okay? There's nothing distinct about this except for how 
indistinct it is. You have hypercellular areas, you have hypocellular areas, very random. And you look and it's composed all of these spindled cells that are making collagen, okay? So here's like a medium cellular area, here's like a very cellular area, here's a hypocellular area, but it's a patternless pattern in a well-circumscribed sort of nugget. That is what a solitary fibrous tumor is. Okay, so the main differential we're gonna have to worry about with the nodular fasciitis is if you're mix, missing a myxofibrosarcoma, okay? Not to be confused with a fibromyxosarcoma, but we don't usually have to worry about those too much. They tend to be deeper soft tissues and they don't pop up in the skin as much. But at low power, you're gonna say, oh, look at these spindled cells and this myxoid background. I'm worried about nodular fasciitis versus a myxofibrosarcoma. So how are you gonna distinguish? Well, you go in and you look at the cells and those fibroblasts in nodular fasciitis should all look benign, meaning they should all look relatively like each other, meaning the side, the side to side oriented ones look like each other and the cross-sectionally cut ones look like each other, right? Because those will differ based on their orientation. But as you can see here, side to side, your nuclei vary in color, size, and then cross-sectionally, they vary also in color and size and shape. They're dark or light. You might see mitotic figures. And, and if you compare side to side, one might be more cellular and dense than the other. So you really have to kind of zoom in and notice that you're dealing with this sort of fibroblastic process. These are making collagen, right? and decide, oh, look at that, look at that, look at those cells, they look too pleomorphic to be something good. This is a myxofibrosarcoma, okay? Here's another look, see your nuclei, you're looking for pleomorphism. So here's a side-by-side -side myxofibrosarcoma, nodular fasciitis. So these nuclei, I mean, they're not perfectly the same. Remember, you've got inflammatory cells mixed in here. So these little dark guys are lymphocytes. You might have a few histiocytes mixed in here. You have to be comparing the nuclei of the fibroblast to the nuclei of the fibroblast compared to this, which looks much more atypical. Okay, so on to fibrohistiocytic things. Our classic fibrohistiocytic tumor is gonna be a dermatofibroma. They could either look more like fibroblasts and be skinny and spindled, or they could look more like histiocytes and be plump. And that whole range we see among dermatofibromas. And they can have this um, induction above them, meaning the epidermis is thickened and darkened, or you can see actual little follicular induction with the sebaceous lobule induction. Anything fibrotic can cause induction, but classically DFs love to do it. You see collagen trapping. Basically, these fibroblasts are kind of clawing their way outward. This thing is vaguely round shaped, and there's a lot of tissue reaction to it, which is a benign feature, okay, as opposed to slithering outward invisibly. That's not a benign feature. It's for, for the most part equivalent to a scarring process. So again, a mature lesion is red and an immature lesion is more blue. So here we see, here's the normal size of your epidermis and here right above the tumor, you have epidermal induction. There's acanthosis of the epidermis and it's hyperpigmented compared to the sides. And it's very flat bottomed. Anytime you see that flat bottom, you have to be aware of an underlying dermatofibromas, because we often get shades of these things, right? And then here you can see in an outline this vaguely round shape of increased cellularity, and you can see these very, very, very dark red collagen bundles as this thing is sort of clawing its way outward. When you go in, the increased cells are these cells among the collagen. So these are our fibrohistiocytic cells. In this case, they look, you know, more fibroblastic, I would say. They're often stellate, meaning they've got little star-shaped legs and, and so the collagen spins off in all directions from it. This is another area where it looks, you know, the cells are more plump, almost histiocytic looking, but this is a collagen trapping again as it grabs the collagen on its way outward. Here's another look, epidermal induction, dermatofibroma, look how big these keloidal collagen bundles are compared to the normal collagen out here. And that's the collagen trapping, okay? Collagen trapping, fibrohistiocytic cells, epidermal induction. 
So this is a different look for the cells. It can go to the fat, but it tends to push the fat as opposed to slithering into the fat like something that a dermatomyofibrosarcoma protuberans might do. So what is a fibrous histiocytoma? Technically, a dermatofibroma is a fibrous histiocytoma. But if a proliferation of these cells doesn't quite match the architecture of a dermatofibroma, like what I just showed you, that collagen trapping, the epidermal induction, then we'll kind of throw it in this wastebastic term of fibrous histiocytoma, which is supposed to be benign, and then they get different names based on the, the appearance of the cells. So this is just an example. You have this epithelial collarette and this lesion that's kind of protruding, and you see there's no real collagen trapping, but it's still a fibrohistiocytic cell, which we know by staining. And this one, looking up close, the cells are more round and epithelioid than spindled and stellate, and this is called an epithelioid histiocytoma, which is a subcategory of a fibrous histiocytoma. Okay, which is just a proliferation of these types of cells, NOS, that doesn't necessarily have the DF architecture. Okay, round, more abundant cytoplasm type cells with a kind of fibrotic background. You can see these like strands of collagen in the background. And this is sort of how it goes outward. It does, you know, it is fibrotic as it descends. And then here's a little bit of inflammation. Another fibrohistiocytic tumor is the giant cell tumor of the tendon sheath. It comes off the tendon sheath, but sometimes, you know, around the digits because it makes a bump in the skin. We'll see them in derm path. But this is another thing on your pink nugget differential. And it's important to note that these fibrohistiocytic things, when they have the histiocyte-like look, early on, the histiocytes are single nucleated histiocytes, and only with time do they become multinucleated giant cells that are obvious to see, and they become more fibrotic with time. So I'm going to show you a few ages of giant cell tumor of the tenon sheath. So here's pink nugget, and then you go in and you look, you have this fibrotic background and these round histiocyte looking cells. Okay, and these histiocyte looking cells all have like a single nucleus. But if you look really close, you start to see a few that start to be, become multinucleated, maybe two, maybe three nuclei. This is a giant cell tumor of the tendon sheath, and it's very cellular still. Now, here's an older one. So with time, now your little nuclei have joined all together, and these giant cells are much more recognizable to you. And the stromal background, that collagen, becomes sclerotic and more obvious, and so the lesion looks less cellular. And these are much easier to identify for you guys. Again, a pink nugget, but then you go in, you have these huge multinucleated cells, lots of the sclerosis in between, less cellularity. And this is an older giant cell tumor of the tendon sheath. Okay. So dermatofibrosarcoma protuberans, DFSP, is a tumor of this cell type. So it tends to be a spindle cell neoplasm with thin wavy collagen fibers. I haven't really seen like a epithelioid version. I guess you might um, just call that more the AFX category. So when it's spindly and uniform like this, it's a DFSP. They're very cellular but also they're fairly monomorphous. So you can't go by pleomorphism to make the diagnosis for this one. You can go by the cellularity and you can go by the growth pattern. This one creeps around, creeps through the collagen, creeps through the fat as if it's invisible. You do not see collagen trapping, okay? You can see induction of the epidermis again because it's a fibrotic process, but you do not see significant collagen trapping. So here's this thin plate-like DFSP, and you can see it's wavy cells. Wavy cells, you get a little bit of epidermal induction, there's your acanthosis and your hyperpigmentation, but you don't see any collagen trapping, and if you looked on the sides, it kind of just leaks outwards. Here's a more recognizable one. You see how your spindled cells just kind of go to the edge, but you don't have that grabbing keloidal collagen look, and then they kind of whirl and twirl sometimes, and it's just these spindled cells. And this is a very cellular one, so lots of nuclei. But if you look closely at the nuclei, they all kind of look alike. And here it's penetrating the fat, sort of invisibly, just slithering in between it. 
So here's a low power view for you to see how this very, very cellular thing just kind of slithers right in through the fat without being seen, okay? And these nuclei are very, very uniform. It's just very cellular, okay? Invisibly creeping, bad sign. So when I think of these wavy cells, I actually think it's often hard to distinguish them from something neural where you have these wavy cells rather than something like a D, because people will often ask, well, how do you know it's not a DF? And, oh, my slide didn't work here, but basically you're supposed to be able to see that these cells are, you know, actually more stellate. They don't really look like DFSP. In DFSP, you get this keloidal, sorry, DF, you get this keloidal collagen trapping and DFSP just sort of runs off the edge without that reaction. The reaction is protective. That means that the tissue is kind of holding it in place, whereas cancer is invisible. So atypical fibrosanthoma is actually like a pseudo malignancy and that's because of the, the benign course. It, it, you know, once you cut it out, it doesn't really do anything else. And it has, it's characteristic got these really bizarre looking atypical cells and it's in this kind of fibrohistiocytic differential but it's more like on the histiocytic side because the cells are bigger rather than looking like little skinny fibroblasts like DFSP does and you can have atypical mitotic figures and this is going to be in your slam differential because it might be very spindled and you're going to have to do some stains and rule out squame and melanoma or smooth muscle tumor or sometimes even vascular tumor. And then you know if it's not any of those, it might be a fibro in AFX. Now, the names have been changing lately. We used to think AFX was a superficial fibrohistiocytic malignancy, whereas an MFH, which stood for malignant fibrous histiocytoma, was a deeper version, but we've removed that name. So now, if it extends into the subcutis or deeper or has aggressive features like perineural or lymphovascular invasion, we call it a pleomorphic dermal sarcoma, a PDS. And then if it's even, you know, there are ones deeper in the body that are called undifferentiated pleomorphic sarcoma, but if it's in the skin, they call them cutaneous undifferentiated pleomorphic sarcoma, which is basically the same as pleomorphic dermal sarcoma, okay? So that's the new naming that's going on right now. So you're gonna see one of these really ugly spindle cell tumor. What's the cell type? You go in, look at these cells. They're very pleomorphic. Some are multinucleated giant cells, really, really ugly nuclei. As soon as I see those super bizarre, ugly nuclei, I think about AFX and you do the stains. Is it S100 melanin A positive? Nope, probably not melanocytic. You could do SOX10 also, a bunch of melanocytic markers. Is it keratin positive? Nope probably not a squame, you check at least two stains probably. If you wanna have a positive stain, CD10, which is a fairly promiscuous stain, um, stains a lot of things, but it also stains AFXs, which might be positive. And because it's a fibrohistiocytic cell type, you know, often it's CD68 positive. So that may or may not help you, okay? Sometimes it looks a little smooth muscle-like, you might do a few um, muscle stains um, and then, as a diagnosis of exclusion, you arrive at atypical fibrosanthoma, assuming it's a superficial lesion. Often we get these as shaved, so you know we might change diagnosis later if you excise it, and we see that it goes really deep and around nerves and into blood vessels, et cetera. Okay, here's another look at it. Look how pleomorphic and ugly your nuclei look. Here's another one. This one's deeper, so maybe this is a pleomorphic dermal sarcoma, but without tissue orientation, it's hard to know how deep this is. This is like a randomly oriented fragment, but you can see very, very ugly cells, bloody tumor, and that's it.